This video is an extract from Multibagger Research Series. This subscription-based research service provides a step-by-step -step framework for analyzing several high-quality businesses, which can potentially become multi-baggers. This framework will set you on your path to financial freedom. You can find the link in the description below. Okay, so we have heard Rupam talking about how some of the richest people build their wealth through conglomerates where they establish a diversified portfolio of businesses under their business entities. So I have a question here for everyone, like does anyone own any conglomerate here or does anyone want to own a conglomerate here? If, if you want, then can you please type in the chat? Just let us know what, what you think. Do you prefer to have a conglomerate for yourself? Derek wants to own Berkshire. And then we have Wang Xiu and John who wants to own a conglomerate and buy what Berkshire. Yep, sounds good. So, so as Rupan has mentioned, how we and Money Wise Smart look at our own portfolio is actually we are, we are all owning our own conglomerate. It's just that we don't own a big stake in them, but we own partial ownership in them. Basically, we are partial partners with these companies and we, we, we don't have control, but we have oversight over their for performance through public foundings and we can always contact them through our private communications with their investor relations. So this is how we look at our own conglomerate where in our world, we can broadly just simplify it as having us, the consumers. And then we have small and medium businesses in this world. And then we also have the large corporates. And basically all the companies that we invest in, they are probably targeting one of these few targets. So. For example, if we start with the small and medium businesses, first we have Stone Cold, a Brazilian financial technology company, helping these SMBs to deal with their payment side and their software side. And then we have Insperity, who deals with HR and compliance matters for these SMBs. And then we have Wix, which Propan just talked about, which is helping the companies to establish a digital presence through websites and help to manage their e-commerce store and stuff. And then now let's come to Intuit where here you see some color coding here. So Intuit targets both SMBs and consumers. That's why it's color coded red and blue. And Intuit offers mainly accounting and tax services, software to SMBs. It's one of the most popular software in the world for SMB in the accounting area. And then the consumers can also use the tax solutions and consumer finance solutions from Intuit. And then next we have JD.com, which targets everyone. So as consumer, probably you have heard of JD, the e-commerce platform where you can buy e-commerce stuff from JD. And then JD basically enables merchants, be it, be they SMBs or large corporates to sell through their platform. That's one of their main business. And then we also have Pax Global, which offers the point of sales devices, which is the product that you see here. Like when you go and pay at the counter, you are probably tapping on a POS and we are using the, the POS and then the SMBs and large corporates are using the POS to accept our payments. Next, for the companies that focus mainly on consumers, we have China Maple Leaf, which is a private education company mainly in China, but now expanding, solely expanding globally. And then we have bought Bank OZK, which basically is a bank that takes dep customer deposits from customers and then lend it to corporates or other businesses, mainly in the real estate area. And then next we have Upwork, which is basically a marketplace that connects talent, flexible talent, like freelancers, which are the consumers. And then with many large corporates, they are focusing on the enterprise side. And they also, I mean, they also help SMBs, but that's not their focus. And then lastly, we also will have another company coming soon, which Rupam has alluded to. And on the large corporate side, we have Adyen, which offers also payment solutions and pay alien focuses mainly on large corporates. So really large customers. So this is basically how we view our conglomerate right now. We have covered about 10 companies now. And I'm just going to launch a poll quickly. So for these companies, these companies are all covered on Teachable. So which companies do you already know reasonably well to the extent that you are comfortable making a decision on whether to own the business or not? 
So we are just wait for a while for people to act on the poll. And in the meantime, if you have any comments, like if you like any of the business, feel free to just type in the chat and we'll be able to see the results pretty soon. Okay, so I'm sharing the results here. As we can see, uh, most people know China Maple Leaf and JD.com. And then following up, we have Bank OZK and then Stone Core and Wix. Cool, that's great. So right now, we are come back to this presentation. And before we go and talk about more a bit about those 10 businesses for everyone to get more familiarized with it, we'll be going through like, what do we actually look out for in our MRS program first? Like what do we look out for and why do we cover certain stuff and not? So in MRS, we try to look for compounders, basically companies that can compound and grow gradually over a long period to become a bigger company where the value of his company goes up. And there's this book by Christopher Mayer called 100 Beggars. I'm not sure, have, have you read it? But it's a really great book. I would recommend everyone to read it. It basically talks about in the past few decades, what companies have actually gone on to grow, to become compounders. And here, this company is called, sorry, this book is called 100 Beggars, which means company that has drawn to 100 times its original value. So there are many, many examples in it. I mean, Coca-Cola is one, Monster, another one, Fastener, and there are a lot of, a lot of such companies. Like it, it sounds quite unimaginable that a company, like imagine you, you put in $10,000 and then it, it grows to $1 million. Like it sounds very, a bit unachievable, but actually there are so many companies in this world that have done that. And what we need is really just to give them time to grow. So now that we know what are com uh, compounders and beggars, and here, these are basically the things that we look out for in selecting our businesses in MRS. So the first point is that it must have a very simple, simple and proven business model, as you will have seen just now among the companies we covered, I would say probably you will agree that most of them are pretty simple. And, and this is very important. And in fact, this is probably one of the most important filter that actually filters out a lot of the companies out there. Like we have been presented with many ideas from many people and they, they all look great. I mean, high growth, good quality, but if it's not simple enough, it's in, not within our circle of competence, we are very happy to drop it because the, the thing that is not appreciated about this part is when things go well, like now we are in a, probably we, we can call it a bull market, everything is going well, companies are all growing. And then when things are well, everything looks good. I mean, there's no problem in the, in, in the business, but if we hold it for many decades, I'm pretty sure that at some point, no, no business is very smooth. There'll definitely be some root block. There'll be some problems. There'll be some competition disruption. And if you don't understand this business, if it's not simple enough, I'm pretty sure that when, when those bad things come, then we could become clueless on how to react. For example, like if we invest in biotech companies, which sound promising, making a lot of sales now, but one day when a competitor comes up and compete with it, I'm not the industry expert in biotech field. So I, I, I can hear what people say, but in the end, I won't be able to comment and provide much value myself. So that's why it's such an important point on what we look out for. And next, we look for great companies. So in the long run, we, the performance of the company and also the stock would largely depend on the performance on the business. And that largely depends on the return on capital that a company can generate on, on its investments. So that's why we look for companies with high return on capital. And ideally they have a lot of reinvestment opportunities for them to reinvest at a high return on capital. Next, we want to be in companies with circular tailwind because we don't want to be fighting the wind. We want to be riding, riding a wave. So it makes it easier to run the business and it must have a very long runway, ideally a global business so that it has enough room for the company to go and compound for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, or even 50, 60 years. Next, in this capitalistic world, if you are a good business, you are, if you're earning a lot of profit and high return on capital, all companies can see that and they will want to come and eat the cake. So a company must really have strong competitive advantages or moods for it to be able to fend itself off this competition to continue to enjoy those returns. And also as a bonus, if these companies have some positive optionality that can allow it to compound exponentially, that will be a great bonus for us. Next point is the company must be a capital like, ideally a capital like business so that it doesn't require too much capital to grow its business and makes it much easier to grow the business. 
And lastly, the management team is important too, and also the board of directors. They must be strong and good capital allocators because we are basically partnering with them and trusting them with our money. And they must be shareholder friendly too, because if I'm putting a lot of money with a company and I want to live with it for the next few decades, I want to make sure that the management is taking care of me, has my interest in his mind and not just his own interest. Otherwise, how can I sleep comfortably? Like what would I know? What would he do to me? Is he trying to optimize the company's performance for me? So that's what we look out for. And which is why we cover our research and structure our research in such way. I'm pretty sure like if you have seen one of the company videos, you'll see that this is the structure that we adopt where what we do is we go through them in a very structured way so that you get all the facts and then you can later on decide whether you think whether what opinion do you have on this company, whether it's a good company based on those facts and analysis of ours. So we start with business introduction on what's the business model, what product does it, does it sell, what value does it offer, what's the business or pricing model, what's the target customer segment and what's the revenue or growth drivers and then what are the competitive advantages which I've just shared about. And then what does the industry look like? Is it growing fast? Is it a long runway? What is the competition dynamics looking like in the market? And then every company has risk. So what are the risks facing this company? And who are the management? Are they good? Are they being paid a lot? How have they been allocating capital? And then we have financial side. I mean, the qualitative story, all the good growth stories must, must match up with the numbers. So we need, need to look at the financials too. And then lastly, a uh, good company doesn't necessarily translate into a good investment. That's why we need to know about its relation to, and that's why we also go into detail and share our thoughts on what the relation look like. So as we have mentioned just now, right now we have covered 10 companies and then there'll be one company coming up very soon. And another thought that we would like to share with you, which, it, which we have shared before, is that because great ideas don't come often, we are always at the back, we are always looking for new companies, always understanding our existing companies more. But that's why we don't promise that we will be covering how many companies a year, because you just won't know when a good company idea will come. Some, some years it can be one or two, some years it can be seven or eight, some years it can be three or four. We just don't know, but we are constantly doing the work digging, digging the research, turning the, the stone to keep, to keep finding good companies. And when we find them, then we'll be discussing those with you. So now we'll be going through a quick short overview of all these 10 companies, about two to three minutes each, just to let you get a sense of like what this company is. And the idea is not to go over the, them in detail because I mean, you have all the access, you have paid us, you have all the access to the, the courses, on Teachable. So depending on which company you are interested in, then later on you can go and read up more about and watch the videos about the companies. And I'll just say, I'll be going through a bit quickly. So, and there'll be some screenshots. They might be a bit too small. If you can't see it, don't worry. You can always watch the replay. And also they'll, you'll, be, you'll be able to get more details in the detailed videos on Teachable too. So now let's start with the first company, Bank OZK. So, Bank OZK was founded by George Grison in 1903, which is, I mean, super long ago, almost a, more than a decade, uh, more than a century now, as a small com community bank back then in the US. And, but this bank has basically grown to very large now, and it has a total loan size of about $19 billion now. And what Bank OZK does is very simple. It's just a bank. I mean, we have all interacted with banks and Bank OZK basically takes customer deposits from customers and also some institutions, and then they lend it out mainly to this RESG, which is the real estate segment. So lending it to developers, building residential buildings or office buildings, multifamily or hotel buildings. And then they also lend some of the money to indirect RV, RV standing for, for recreational vehicles. And then a marine site, which is like all the yachts, if it, uh, if consumer want to buy a yacht, they can get a loan from Bank OZK. And then Bank OGK also does some community banking and IESG side. So one interesting thing about this bank is that a lot of companies would think that oh, the, the bigger you grow, the better you are. But Bank OGK's vision is not to be the biggest bank, but they just simply want to be the best one. And in fact, they have been recognized for that because 
as you see here, they have been winning a lot of awards consistently. And here they just won some uh, award, I think a few weeks ago, where they were recognized for excellence. And this is recognized over a few decades, not just a few years or uh, one year, but the performance was actually judged based on 2000 to 2020, a 20 year period. So why, why is Bank OZK the best bank? Basically, Bank OZK does a few things very well. The first is because banking is a sort of like a commodity business, meaning there's not, not much differentiation between players. What they do is they really focus on underwriting quality very well, making sure that the loans that underwrite have very high quality so that they, they won't get a lot of bad loans and actually those will come back to, to penalize them later. So as you can see here, over the years from 1997 to 2019 or 2020, for their net charge off ratio, which is how much they have written off and char charge off, they have been consistently below the industry. They are almost at one third of the industry, even though they deal with real estate loans, which many people say that is one of the riskiest areas you can lend to. And the other thing that Bank OZK does very well is it controls its cost very well. It has a lot of discipline. So this chart basically shows the efficiency ratio, which is how much non-interest non expense the bank is incurring as a percentage of its net revenue. So basically like when you earn a dollar of revenue, how much do you actually need to spend for your, for your overheads? And Bank OZK has consistently been hitting a ratio of about 40%. And you can see the industry is at about 60%. Not many banks can actually hit below 50%. That means Bank OZK can have a very low cost base. That's why it can afford to charge the same price or even lower price than their competitors, but still earn a high profit and return on capital. And that's the interesting part about this business. On top of the other few interesting things we have covered in detail in our videos. Next, we talk about China Maple Leaf. And, and I'm sure like just now from the poll, most of you has known about this company already, which where CML is a leading international operator in school operator in China and increasingly globally. It was founded by German uh, German Gen in 1995. Here you can see it's mainly in China and it's in a lot of cities and provinces in China. And China Maple Leaf basically targets the middle class families. So they are not the top schools, but they, and they don't charge the top rates, but they are targeting the middle class people where these families want to send their children overseas. As you can see here, as of financial year 2020, which is last year in calendar year 2020, they have a student count of about 45, 46,000 students. And most of them are in preschools and then going up to elementary, middle and high school. And their revenue mainly comes from the high school. The high school is the most profitable part. And what they offer is, they used to offer a bilingual British curriculum, in short BC curriculum, where they took it from Canada. And then these are recognized in, in Canada where the students after graduating, they can go to Canada. But now Maple Leaf has actually launched its own Maple Leaf World School program in 2020. And this is a program almost equivalent to like A-level where I'm sure all of you know A-level, like if you have that certificate, most of the universities would accept you. And Maple Leaf has been getting a lot of recognition for their program. So what's interesting about CML is that in terms of their operating results, let's look at what their students achieve. So in financial year 2020 or school year 2020, about 2,300 students, high school students graduated from, from that batch. And then about 80% of them actually got an offer, at least an offer from one of the top 100 universities. Think about it, like how, how amazing if your parent, what your, your children managed to get into one of the top 100 universities and for that batch that there are 80 percent of the students who get it and about 10 percent of that batch actually got into one of the top 10 universities so this is really good operating record i mean how many people you know that have actually gone on to study in one of the top 10 universities like howard stanford and stuff so and the other part about cml's business is is very asset like where in when building new schools instead of building the schools itself it, it also chooses to partner with local government so the government will provide the land build the buildings for them and basically CML just go in and run it. And this has advantages for the local governments because it will help to stimulate the economic environment there and manage to attract uh, people to work there, expatriates to work there and just boost up the whole environment. And CML also have a negative networking capital because when you pay tuition fees, you pay one year in advance. And once CML gets that money one year in advance, they can go and spend to expand their business, which makes it easier to grow their business. The next company is JD, which most of you are familiar already. 
So JD is a leading Chinese e-commerce company founded in 1998. And yes, a few big business segments, it has a lot of businesses, but some of the few big ones are first JD retail, where it does e-commerce in China. So it does first party and third party where first party, they are basically buying the merchandise and stocking up the merchandise from merchants in, in their uh, warehouses, and then they'll sell it. So they carry the inventory risk. While for third party, they are just a marketplace platform for merchants to go and list their products there. And then the merchants will sell those inventory or goods directly to the customers. Next, then we have JD Logistics, which has also been spun off from JD and listed itself in Hong Kong Stock Exchange and then JD Health too. And then they are thinking of spinning out JD Digit and, and list it too. So one interesting point about JD is its capacity to suffer where it was very willing to make long-term investments. So back then it was competing with Alibaba, I mean, one of the more uh, leading competitors, but JD, what JD does different, did differently back then was it, cho it chose to invest in, it, in its own logistic and warehouses. So it has so far built about 900 plus warehouses with 21 million square meters of floor area and hiring almost 200,000 delivery personnel. So this, all this costs a lot of money, high capital expenditure, but now that they have built all these things up, they, they can control the quality very well. They can deliver in almost one day or even within a few hours after you order. So they've progressed a lot on that front. So in the past years, when they are heavily reinvesting here, they are actually making a lot of losses. So as you can see here in, in this chart, the green line is the operating profit margin. It has always been negative, negative 4%, 2% for many, many years. And, and people were wondering whether would they actually make profit, but the, the payoffs finally paid off in 2019 and 2020, where based on gap accounting terms, they have turned profitable. And now they basically have one of the most advanced warehousing and logistic infrastructure in China. And everyone is trying to use their service to where they sell their logistic service to them. So this is possible because now JD has hit the skill economics to have such large scale to, to compete over the competitors and spread over its fixed investment cost. And JD also has a very strong advantage in network effect where the more buyers is uh, on its platform, the more sellers want to be there. And then this cycle just goes on and on. And it has also established a good branding for quality. Next, we have Upwork. Upwork is a leading flexible talent solution provider and one stock marketplace for freelancers and businesses founded in 2015. So we have all seen, I mean, COVID-19 hit us. Most people are working remotely and more companies are increasingly becoming more open to hiring digital, digital workers like freelancers, not necessarily their own employees, own full-time employees, but just a, a freelancer engaged from a platform. And Upwork is basically this marketplace that connects the businesses to the freelancers. So for Upwork, it handles a lot of things. It offers a lot of solutions from hiring, like you can, uh, try to search for talent on this platform, then you can track the proposal. And then on the working side, once you get a talent on board, you can collaborate with them and have messaging apps. And then Upwork also helps to handle the payment side where the companies can bill and invoice the work easily, including escrow accounts. And then there are also ways to measure and like including data analytics and stuff. So as of 2020 quarter four, the gross services volume transacted on Upwork's platform was around about 0 0.7 billion US dollars. So in a year times four is about 3 billion US dollars. That's the amount of activities generated there. And Upwork is, is not like a, a, a freelancer, like gig, gig work, like it's competitor fever, which mainly does a lot of gig work. This is not like $5 project, $10 or $50 project. This can be very large projects where Upwork are basically targeting most, a lot of the Fortune 500 companies, very large accounts, mid-sized to large accounts that takes up more than 20% of its GSV now, like Microsoft will be hiring a whole team on, on using Upwork. And then they'll just maintain that digital talent bench at Upwork there. So like instead of spending a few months to hire a full-time employee, putting up the series, interviews and stuff, they can hire within like a few hours or even within a few minutes on Upwork with all the portfolio of that employee already put, putting up there. So it's easy to choose and select the, the freelancers. And because these customers spend a lot, they actually have a lot of lifetime value and they, they stay with Upwork constantly, con continually spending a lot. So as of 2020, Upwork's client spend retention is 102%, which means, for example, if Microsoft is spending, say, 
100,000 a year with Upwork. Next year, they are going to spend 102,000. And this number has been consistently around 100%. So that's the powerful part about this recurring nature of Upwork's services. And then in terms of market size, Upwork is dealing about two, two to three billion GSV now, but the global remote work opportunity is in trillions. It's almost 1.3 trillion. So we can imagine how much runway this company has. And then one mode that Upwork has is the network effect where once you get on more clients, there'll be more projects on the platform. There'll be more GSVs. That means there'll be more freelancers because they know that there are good quality jobs there that they can get. And then there'll be more skills offered and then it will attract more clients. And, and this cycle just goes on and on. Now let's look at Insperity. Insperity is a leading PEO, standing for a professional employer organization firm in the US founded in 1986. So PEO is a, still a pretty interesting and new, new model in the US and probably non-existent in a lot of other countries where unlike traditional employment, how a PEO organization work is that they will do a core employment with the clients and they mainly deal with small and medium businesses. So when the SMB want to hire an employee, instead of hiring them themselves and then have, having to deal with the HR and compliance side, they talk to Insperity and say, let's, let's call employee this customer. And then Insperity will even go and recruit those uh, sorry, employees for them. And then after that, they will deal with basically all the HR, all the compliance, all the tax related insurance, all the benefits, performance support, training and development, everything for, for the company. Because imagine these SMBs are like, maybe they can be even like five people team or 10 people team where they are still struggling to find their, their place in, in the market where they are developing their products. The founders have so much things to focus on. They, they don't have time to deal with all these HR issues and they probably don't have their in-house HR team too. That's why Insperity will come very handy here. And this is very important in US because in US, unlike a lot of countries, the HR compliance and tax compliance side is very complicated. So, and it's, it's just getting more and more complicated. That's why this is providing a strong tailwind for people to start switching from the traditional employment model to core employment model, where we can see here in the US, there are about 71 million small and mid-market employees. And then only 8% of them are using core employment model and 92% are not yet. Of course, it won't be a 100% core employment model in the future, but we will see more shift, shifting from core employment to traditional traditional employment in the future giving this tailwind, which has been happening for many years in the past. And here we see the client retention rate of the clients called employed by workers called employed by Insperity. And they are basically around 80%. And this basically give Insperity a lot of recurring business and recurring revenue. And 80% is not low. Like, I mean, they are tech companies with like 90, 100%, but for Insperity, they are dealing with SMBs where the survival rate in among SMBs, we know it's just low. Like many companies just die off after a few years, especially SMBs because they're still small. But Upwork can have such high retention because they target a lot of the higher quality clients. They, they, they don't just accept any clients because they know that it's just not just about the growth. It's about the, the kind of risk that you're bringing in with, with the growth too. So they actually select very carefully their clients and have a very diversified industry in terms of their clients. That's why they are actually not significantly hit by COVID unlike some of their competitors. And the very interesting thing about Insperity is, is very capital light. In fact, negative networking capital because they are collecting the payroll related staff and taxes for it on behalf on, of the employers and other regulator, regulatory authorities in advance first. So they actually have a float. They can use this networking, negative working capital for them to invest in their business. So you can see here in this chart, the blue line is basically the net income. And then the red line is the operating cash flow. You can see the operating cash flow is consistently significantly higher than the net income. And that's because of the negative networking capital dynamics. And because of this, they can return a lot of value back to shareholders, be it through share purchase, which is a green bar, and, or dividends, which is the yellow bar. So they are generating so much cash, they are flooded with cash that every year they can give a lot back to the shareholders while still growing pretty fast. Next, we have Adyen. Adyen is a leading global modern payments company founded in 2006 with a full payment stake solution. And what this means is that if we look at the traditional value chain in payments, imagine when you buy a stuff, e-commerce stuff from, from say Amazon, and then you make the payment. And then what you see is just, oh, you have made the payment successfully. The, the 
product will be shipped to you, but actually back end, within that one second before your payment is accepted, there are so many things going on. Like that payment data transaction activity will actually go through the gateway and then it will go through risk management and then it will go through processing and then the acquirer will be involved too. And then net networks like Visa and MasterCard and then it will go to the issuer, which is the, the entity issuing the credit card or debit card for, for you. And then after that, after everyone approves this, the, the data will go all the way back to, to the merchant before this payment is accepted. And in this chain, there are so many different parties involved. They are not, they, they might not be the same party. In, in fact, most of the time they are very different entities and they have to talk to each other. And imagine if you are a, a global business, say, say Nike, you, you sell your shoes everywhere in the world. And then in not, not just that you have many parties for one country, you have like 200 different countries and all the countries that could be using different parties. So this quickly scales up to like many, so many like tens or hundreds of parties involved just for you to accept payments globally. But at the end, may actually deals that with that conveniently for, for the merchants. So they can actually have dealt with many local payment methods in the world and then basically cooperated with them. So to allow the merchants to be able to accept them easily. And with Adyen, that basically means that if today you are, you are a competitor of Nike and then you want to sell globally, you just need to talk to Adyen, just one contract, one integration, and then you can accept all these local payment methods in, in the world. And Adyen has one of the highest acceptance of the local payment methods in, in the world. And they also have a lot of uh, a very high rate of conversion and also they can track the fraudulent activities if very effectively. That's why it has managed to uh, attract a lot of big customers who sign up with them, where I'm sure you have recognized many companies here. I mean, Tesla, Zara, Expedia, what else? We have Dropbox, we have Uber, we have Under Armour, Crocs, Booking.com, Airbnb, like or Facebook, Spotify, all these big companies that does business probably, they, they know that Adyen is one of the best foreigners out there. That's why they'll go with them. And this is a very good point for Adyen's business because if you think about it, Adyen is charging a percentage of every transaction. So here you see these customers. I mean, Tesla is growing its revenue crazily. Facebook, Spotify, Airbnb, these are all high growth companies. So when they grow their revenue, they actually need to pay more to Adyen. That means Adyen's revenue just keep growing without them actually having to spend any more marketing money if they choose not to, because they'll just grow with their clients. And, and these clients are all fast growing, large clients, stable clients. And that's why we see their compounded annual growth rate for revenue and profits has been pretty high above 50, 60% for many years. Next, we'll look at one similar company called Stone Core, which is a Brazilian modern fintech financial technology or payments company founded in 2012. And just think of it as a square of Brazil, but Square does both the merchant side and the consumer side, but Stone Core just does the merchant side. So Berkshire Hathaway is actually an investor. Warren Buffett didn't choose this company, but his, one of his fund managers, Totcom, chose it. And like Square, imagine if you're a business SME in, in Brazil, you want to set up your business, you need to accept payments. You need to, to have a point of sales device for you to accept payments in your retail shop. And you pay, can basically talk to Stone Cold and then they'll send the POS to you within a few hours or one day. And then they'll also offer you some software. Like if you need marketing software, if you need enterprise resource branding software, and if you need e-commerce software, they have all the software all integrated to you. Like instead of you going to different vendors, you just need to talk to Stone Cold. And they also offer banking and credit solutions. So if you want to bank account, you can talk to them. And if you want to borrow money, either for your booking capital or for your growth, Stone Cold offers all those too because they have already have all your data. They can see how much money is coming in every day. They can track your credit risk very good. So they, that's why they can lend you money within, within a few seconds. Like you go to their platform, they already pre-approved your ability to lend certain amount of money from, from them. So this makes it very easy for SMEs to do business in Brazil. And the good thing is look at the total addressable market. Here, the, the TAM total addressable market was around 120 billion Brazilian real. And Stone Cold just had a 3% market share. And Stone Cold is basically competing with a lot of very inefficient legacy government protected banks in, in that market. But now the regulations have started opening up since I think 2010. So there are only a few modern players there now, the large players. So Stone Cold is having very easy win, low hanging fruit, just killing this low competent, inefficient legacy players. And the interesting point about Stone Cold's business is 
it's trying to establish a distribution network and a close relationship with all the clients. So you can see they started with payments where they've grown their payments client consistently quite fast. And they have about 800,000 clients now. And then once they have built up their banking software, bank uh, credit solutions, and also other software solutions, they started cross-selling these solutions to those clients. And because they, these clients, they know how much value Stone Core can offer. And because all the solutions are all integrated, they can just go to this one shop, one stop shop for everything. And they'll just buy this stuff from Stone Core. And that's where the average revenue per customer just shows up, giving a lot of revenue, incremental revenue and operating leverage from for Stone Core. Next, let's look at Pax Grobo, which is a payments and abroad company founded in, founded in, sorry, this, this number is wrong. It's founded quite some time ago. And, being, and it is one of the top three point of sales device provider in the world. So these are basically the point of sales device that you see in shop, in retail shop, when you need to pay, you take out your card, you tap on these this POS devices. And some of you might think that this is a commodity business. I mean, what, what can be so different about these POS devices? It's just a piece of device sitting there, nothing special. But if you look at the market share in 2018, in the developed world, in US, Canada, Latin America, sorry, Latin America, we can count it up in Europe, for these countries that actually value the security more, I mean, you're dealing with money. Like if someone hacks into that, if the device is not working properly in terms of security, it can cause a lot of problems. So these countries value the security more than the developing countries that value the cost more as of now. You can see in these developed countries, the market share of the top three players are around 50 to 60%. And then for some reason in Latin America, it's the same too. So why, why can an industry that seems like a commodity type of business have so much concentration among the top three players. If it's a commodity, then everyone will be the same, but that's not the case. And that's because a lot of R&D is actually involved. You need to spend a lot of R&D to spread out the scale, to build the relationship with all the different acquirers and banks. And what is interesting about PAX is PAX is increasingly taking market share from the other two leading players. And they are actually very innovative. They have spent a lot of money on R&D and Right now, we see more smarter solutions, smarter POS like this Android POS. And Pax Global is actually one, is, is the first player that launched this POS device, the smarter ones. That's why they have a first mover advantage and their technology is better. They have more different models than their competitors. And their competitors are actually shifting their focus away from hardware to software, and which makes it easier for, for Pax Global to continue to grow fast in this business, in this industry. That's why we see from 2010 to 2020, Pax Robo has been growing revenue at about 23% and then operating profit at about 20% too. And we know payments is going to continue to big in the future. Next, we have Intuit. Intuit is an American financial software company founded in 1984, also a, a quite old company that has been around for almost 40 years. So the flagship products of Intuit are four products. First, TurboTax, which is a tax software for consumers and businesses to file their tax online. Tax in America is very complex. And this software basically simplifies the life for them and is, is the leading tax software over there. And then we have QuickBooks, which is an accounting software. And this is um, in a lot of the countries in the world, this is the most popular accounting software in the world. Ask, ask all the accountants and they'll know uh, this accounting software offered by QuickBooks and is, has a lot of market share. And then Intuit also have two other consumer finance solutions, which is Mint and also another product called um, Credit Karma, which it acquired recently. So Intuit is targeting small businesses, self-employed individuals, and also consumers. And what's interesting about Intuit is it has survived a lot of disruptions. So it was started in 1984. That was the era of those, but it continuously adapt itself disrupt itself and reimagine itself to, to, to survive in this world and thrive well. So they've gone through the era of Windows where they have to switch everything to Windows and then website came. So they have to cater their business to website and then mobile devices became popular and crowd. So they have to revamp their products to switch their, move their products to the crowd. And then now they think they're in the era of artificial intelligence where they are building very powerful AI systems and algorithms to try to make everything simple for their customers and try to revolutionize the speed to benefit. So for example, 
last year in 2020, we have COVID-19 and then in the US, there were government giving subsidies and grants. And but that until a lot of like different rules and guidelines, like a few hundred pages documents. And Intuit basically just asked its AI software to read all those. And then after a while, the AI came up with a guideline, a very simple step one, step two, step three guideline for the small, medium businesses. And these businesses basically just can use this to very simplify their process to, to, to apply for the loans or grants and then claim, claim for the loans. So that's how powerful this AI is. And Intuit has been able to disrupt itself all this while because in, there's one interesting part about Intuit where it focuses a lot on a concept called design to delight where it, it thinks about its customer all the time. They are not focused with the existing solution. They are always focused on their obsessed with the customer problems. So they always think about what is the problem? What is the true problem and how can they solve it? If solving it requires a totally different product, they are completely okay to kill their own products so that they can innovate and, and disrupt themselves before anyone disrupts them. And this goes to the extent where they will even follow their customers to the offices or even to their house to see how they actually use their products so that they know how best to tailor to their needs instead of just having a phone call with them and then or asking the customers to come to their office. They will, that's not their natural environment. They want to see what works best for those customers in their natural environment. So they will follow these customers to their house. And that has been quite a success. So Intuit has been growing pretty well over the past few decades. And for future long-term expedition, they are expecting a, a double digit growth in terms of revenue. And Intuit is already very big, but it can still grow double digit and gross margin will be staying fat at about 82%. And I mean, this is very high gross profit margin, 82%. But because of operating leverage and because of efficiencies extracted from their powerful AI software and, and analytics, they can drive their sales and marketing, research and development, GNA expenses down in the future. So the operating income is expected to grow faster than revenue. Last, we have Wix, and we'll be talking about Wix in more detail later in this part of the meetup. So I'll just be going this through very quickly. Wix is a leading web development and e-commerce SaaS business, software as a service business, founded in 2006. And basically, they are focusing on making website building easy. I mean, like if we don't know how to code, then it's, it's a nightmare for us. We need to hire a developer, we need to hire a designer, but they actually make it very easy, do-it-yourself platform for you to build very beautiful uh, websites in, in a, it can even be in a few seconds if you are not choosy or in, in a few hours. And on top of that, they also offer marketing tools, customer experience tools, logo makers, and they also offer many vertical specific solutions and including e-commerce solutions. And they also have, for, for those who want to do more with their websites and do more complex features, Wix is very powerful too. It's not just a simple website builder that with its editor X and Chloe by Wix, by Wix, which was launched in around 2020, fully launched in 2020 or 2021. If you know how to use it, you can do tremendous things on this platform, almost like doing your own coding, but in a low code or no code environment. So to Wix chairman is called Mark, who is the, uh, I think the founder or partner of the VC firm, venture capital firm, which invested in Wix very early on. And to Mark, he said Wix is just about three things. First is a product machine, basically, like it just keep on churning products. So you can see here over the years, it turns out so many different products that are useful for the customers. And then second, Wix is a global company. I think Wix is in about 190 countries in the world now. So very global right from the start. And lastly, Wix is a marketing machine. So Wix chief marketing officer has, a, has only one uh, KPI, key performance indicator, which is something called a Troy metrics, which is a time to return on investment spend, marketing spend. So that is basically like if you spend 10 million of marketing expense in quarter one to acquire a cohort, then their target is to get every, recoup everything back within three quarters. So seven to nine months, they need to collect back cumulative about 10 million back from the customer so that they break even. And then after that, it's just incremental profit. So as long as the Troy is seven to nine months, if they think they can hit it, they'll just keep reinvesting because there are so much runway. And that's because they, they are willing to do that because here we look at the cohort economics. Here it basically says, let's, let's take the blue line. That's for a cohort acquired in quarter one. This is the number of paid users and we can see premium subscriptions. And we can see after eight years, that number is actually higher than the, the first quarter. So the, 
Wix has a very sticky business. The users stick with them. And not only that, in terms of not only in terms of volume, but in terms of revenue, these customers continue to spend more upgrading the products, paying for higher plans, moving from website to e-commerce plans, and, and adopting more solutions. So this makes Wix a very powerful SaaS business with recurring revenue and, and growing recurring revenue. So now let's take a quick look at the financials. We'll just talk about them in aggregate terms. So we can see here in terms of revenue, Wix, sorry, uh, the 10 companies plus the 11 company, they have been growing their revenue pretty well. From 2016 to 2020, they have been compounding at an average rate of about 30%. I mean, some are lower, some are higher. We can see here on average is about 30%. And then for gross profit, coincidentally, this is not a mistake. I mean, they also are compounding at an average rate of about 29.7%. Some of the bars have moved, but the average is still 30%. This, this means that these companies actually manage to maintain their gross profit margin pretty well. And this is what we see here. In terms of gross profit margin, most of them are cons consistently above 40%. Here we see three companies, which means that they have pricing power. Customers are willing to pay quite some money to them because their products are good or other for other reasons. But here we can see there are three companies that have a gross profit margin low, lower than 40%. Does that mean that they're bad? No, but they are having low GPM because they actually have their own reasons. So for Insperity and Adyen, they are having low gross profit margin just because of how the accounting is done. They are recording things on a gross basis and they actually are recording a lot of pass-through costs in the revenue. So all the pass-through costs are recorded as cost of revenue. That's why naturally they have a low, low gross profit margin. If you want to know more, you can watch our detailed videos to understand this. And then for JD.com, JD is one of the main business is in the retailing business. I mean, in retail business, how, what's the profit margin we, we look at? I mean, normal traditional retailers is just a few percentage per percentage point margin. It's a, it's a cutthroat business. But JD, because of its other services and because of its sales scale benefit and other so, uh, software solutions and service solutions, they actually have a pretty high gross profit margin if we take into account the industry-specific economics. Next, let's look at net profit. So net profit on average for these companies have compounded at about 24% from 2016 to 2020. And here you'll see that there are quite some companies with no data here and we have excluded them from the average. And that's because that a lot of these companies have actually have negative profits. They have positive cash flows, but they are reinvesting so much and those reinvestments happen in the income statement. That's why we see a ne negative net profit. So we can't calculate a growth rate. So for net profit margin, and sorry, and for some of the companies just now that have no bar, it's it could be also because that in 2016, which is the base year that we take, the net profit is negative. So we, we can't calculate the growth rate. It's, it's not meaningful. So now in terms of net profit margin, we can see the net profit margin of this company has been quite stable or even rising for some of them. So pretty much like these companies are rising. And then for the uh, outliers, we can see again, JD.com has a low net profit margin because it's a retailer. Insperity is low and Adyen is low because of their revenue base due to the accounting treatment. And then Upwork and Wix have negative net profit margin because they are reinvesting so much. They are actually they can actually be very profitable if they want, but just because the runway is so much, tailwind is so strong, they want to reinvest. That's the right thing to do. And then we don't just stop at profits. What matters to us shareholders in free cash flows? So we, we focus a lot on the free cash flow conversion of our companies to all the companies within our this conglomerate that we are trying to build. So you can see here the companies, most of them have free cash flow conversion of 100% if not more than 100%. So there, there'll be some companies that like for JD.com, the accounting is very complex. You, we need to adjust them, but we haven't adjusted them in this chart. So that's why it's less than 100% in, in the latest year. And then for Upwork and Wix, they are reinvesting. That's why their free cash flow sometimes are negative or their net profit are negative. So that's why the calculated ratio won't be meaningful. And for Adyen, it's very high, but this again is distorted due to gap accounting that if we if we understand the true economics, the free cash flow conversion is actually 100%. Just like some companies, due to accounting, the, the number is understated. Like in this case for Adyen, it's actually overstated. So, and for Stone Cold, it's the other way around. So if we adjust it, the free cash flow conversion is actually 80 to 100%. The only company within these 11 companies that have low, not perfect free cash flow conversion is Pax Global. And we have covered this in detail in our detailed videos on Teachable, and that's because of their positive networking capital cycle, which all investors have to take note if you want to invest in this company. And 
in terms of lastly, in terms of return on capital, because that, that drives how much return the company is generating when they reinvest, most of our companies actually have ROE of at least 15% or more. Sorry, this line is, is at the 10%. I should have moved it to 15%. There's some, some issues there, but if you look at here, most of them are above 15%. And for those that don't have bars, they are either reinvesting here for weeks and upward, and Stone Cold is below 15% because Stone Cold is reinvesting so much which depresses the short-term profits. So that's a quick introduction of our conglomerate that we are trying to build here. So I hope you find it interesting. So now let's run a quick poll to see which companies are you actually interested in at this point. We have talked about 10 companies now, like just based on this quick introduction, like what companies are you interested in? You can choose more than one. And I'm sure at this stage, a lot of you would have questions on these companies that we have just talked about. If you have questions, you can put it on the chat group and probably some of your questions will also be addressed in our re detailed videos on Teachable. So when you are free, feel free to go and watch them. I'll just give it a few more seconds for us to get the poll results. Okay, I'm, I'm stopping here. So let me share the results. Interesting. Well, we have a clear winner. Can you all see the results? So finally, I do know this, uh, who wants to be a millionaire? There's this audience poll. So this is something like this. <laughs> Wix is the winner. So I'm going and investing in Wix right now. <laughs> we should all, all go and invest. Just, just yeah. kidding. Yeah. yeah. So we I have... hope guys, please don't do that. You know, it's, uh, I mean, you know, this, of course, this is a great business, but uh, do spend some time in building your own conviction. As they say, uh, you know, uh, you can always borrow someone else's uh, idea, but uh, you can never borrow someone else's conviction. So build your own conviction; it'll go a long way. Yep, agreed. And and just so for the interest, I mean, we will be uploading the recording of this session on Teachable, but on the recording we actually can't see the poll results. So I'll just quickly say out some of the popular companies so that we actually can remember like oh back then everyone thought this company is in more interesting so from top to down we have Wix as the clear winner and then we have Adlion and Upwork on par 63% of you say you are interested and then I think we have Stone Cold and then we have JD.com next we have a few companies on par being Bank OZK, China Maple Leaf and Pax Global and next we have Inspirity and lastly we have in tweet. So interesting. And, and we'll see when we launch the, the next company, the 11 company, I'm sure like you'll probably rank one, one, on one of the top three, if not, if not the, the top one. So we are, we'll be able to revisit in, in our next meetup next time. So now let's move on. So now let's think about like, talk about how can we actually use the research that we have produced? How best should you think about it so that you can best benefit from from our multi bagger research series program. I mean, all of you have paid money to us. We really want you to be able to extract a lot of benefit from this program. So let's start with looking at a quote in the book, 100 Beggars first. So for those who have read, you will probably have seen this quote, which is to make money in stocks, you must have the vision to see them, the courage to buy them and the patience to hold them. And according to Phelps, patience is the rarest of the three. So, I mean, in, in, in these times now, there are so many people talking about big businesses, good businesses in the public on internet. I'm pretty sure like finding good companies are, are not the difficult part. We like, if, if it's a good company, everyone would, would have already talked about, talk about it on the internet. So I think personally, I think what's the most difficult for a lot of the retail investors to actually profit from it, even though they, they know that this is a good business, is the ability to hold them for long, to, to go through the tights patiently. So does anyone agree that's holding on to a great company is actually the hardest. So just let me know your thoughts in the chat. Like, which do you think is the hardest? Is it holding or finding the courage to buy them, the vision to see them? Come on, let's, let's make it a bit interactive to see what thoughts you have. Or what are some of the personal struggles you have? The vision to see them by Ishan. Connor say difficult to hold for very long periods. Yep. 
Kian Tech agrees holding through the volatile period. Ah, now, nowadays, I mean, especially during COVID time, the markets are volatile. John Kong says courage and patience. So all, all good answers. So now let's look, look at another quote by Ian Cassell, who is a micro cap investor. And he basically says that you can borrow someone else stock ideas, but you can't borrow their conviction. True conviction can only be obtained by trusting your own research over that of others. Do the work so you know when to sell. Do the work so you can hold. Do the work so you can stand alone. I, I really agree with Ian Castell here. And I think that's like, you really can't borrow other, I mean, you can borrow the ideas, but the conviction is what matters, is what makes you able to hold your company for long. I mean, there'll be bad things happening to your company, hopefully not soon, but I mean, I'm pretty sure in the next few decades, there'll be something bad happening to your company in, in this world. I mean, if, if the, the business is all smooth, I would actually run away from this business because I'll be, I'll be very scared whether the company is cooking its books or, or trying, to, trying to paint a good picture because there's just no way you can run a business. If, if some of you are a businessman, you'll know that things just happen in, in this business world. It's so uncertain. So, which is why I think for, for us to have the conviction, we think that everyone needs to have a strong understanding of business so that when bad things happen, you can actually differentiate, is it a temporary bad thing or is it a structural or permanent thing? Like has it uh, permanently impact the business ability to make profits and generate high return on capital? So, which is why we need to understand the business very well. I mean, it takes time to understand the business, but here in multi banker research series, this is why we have presented the facts to you in a structured manner, covering the different aspects of the businesses. And we have also presented our analysis to you. I mean, most of the content are actually very factual facts. You can actually go to the source and check it if you want. And if you can't find a source, you can ask us. And then it's up to you to think based on what we say, what are the facts? What do you think of them? Do you agree with our analysis? What are your thoughts? Maybe you are in the industry, you, are, you, are, you know more than us on certain aspects, then, then you can go, go and make your own judgment because ultimately what we have presented to you is facts. Facts are correct. I mean, opinions can be wrong, but if you are using the facts, then you are not risking yourself to other people's opinions and you can always form your opinions after hearing many people's opinion. So that's why we would suggest that from our poll, we see that most people have only watched less than 50% of the content we already put up there on Teachable and we are cons continuously upload more content as we discover new companies or understand more about our existing companies. And, and there's actually one, one guy who has watched 50, more than 50% of it. I'm, I'm actually very curious like who, who he is. So if he or she is not shy, like he can just put in the chat and then, and then a, a good kudos to you. So, and, but some of these stuff are not, I mean, a business, it takes time to understand. So if any of you have any, any questions, please don't, don't, don't have second thoughts. Just post it on Facebook group. There's no silly questions. Just ask whatever you have. Most likely if you have a question, someone else is thinking that question too. So if you ask it in the group, we can respond to you publicly, Like we can't give personal investment recommendations. So you, if you personally message us, we can't, we can't respond to you because we are not licensed to provide any personal investment advice, even though it can be a simple comment, but we, we face the risk of being one day the regulator re-authority come to us and say, oh, you have made this statement. We, we see it, we interpret it as an advice. So then we, our business could, could, could go away. So that's why we won't do that. So that's why I encourage you to put on our Facebook group. And by putting there, you not only get our opinions, but you also get the opinions from the whole community. And lastly, I'll say in the end, no one cares about your finance more than yourself. So if you really want to compound your wealth, build your wealth for the long term, it's worth spending time like every day or every week, just spend a few minutes or a, a half an hour to watch some of the videos progressively and the efforts will be of it. And lastly, we also talk about valuation. So after presenting to you all the facts on different aspects, and then we'll tell you how we actually value this company and then what are the exact assumptions that we use. We talk about them in our videos and then you can see whether you are, you are comfortable with our assumptions or the way we think about it. If you think we are too conservative, then go ahead, go and pay a higher price. Or if you think we are crazy, we are too overly optimistic, you, or you prefer to have less risk, you are more risk averse, you want to be more conservative, then go ahead and adjust the, uh, the relation, whatever that suits you best is, is your own investment. Everyone has a different, different context, different background, different circumstances. 
And regardless of what you think about valuation, I think one thing that you can definitely take away from our analysis a lot is you can focus on whether you agree with our facts and analysis on whether what is the quality of this business and the longevity of this business. Because these two actually are the very important aspects of a business that will actually determine the long-term compounding effect of a business and the return for you as a shareholder. And here we are think about it using some examples. So let's now look at some ways to think about how we can actually think about the relation of the company. How do we decide when to buy or not? And, and anyway, this is not a re investment recommendations and also how we can think about our portfolio constructions. So let's look at one example here. So if you have watched our Stone Cold valuation video, you will have seen this chart. I mean, sorry, this, this slide is actually taken, taken from there. So back then in 2020, around September, we valued Stone Cold. We look at the Stone Cold price. Back then, it was about $50 a share back then. And then we talk about how we think about the valuation of this company. And then we show, we actually show what type of growth is implied in this $50 per share US dollars. And, and, and we, we mentioned that this is how Stone Cold, if Stone Cold performs like this, then it's worth $50. And we say that it's a bit on the optimistic side, that set of metrics, that set of projections, but it could still be reasonable. And that's our conclusion. So if you think we are, if you think that that is definitely achievable, then you can pay something higher. If you don't think so, then just aim for a lower, lower entry, entry price that you are comfortable with with this business. But regardless of what price you think is 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 the value for this business, we can think about our portfolio returns from this way. So since September 2020 until now, it has been I think more than half a year. So let's say Stone Coast value has grown by 10%. And if say we, we are, if you're comfortable with paying $50, then now it's probably worth $55. And say, I don't know what's the share price today, but let's say it's around 60, $65. That means it's overvalued by about 20% based on our, our intrinsic value estimation of $55. So what do we do? Do we just not buy or do we buy? I mean, it's up to personal preference, but what we are going to introduce you to is a way to think about this and then you can make your own decision, which is say if our analysis is right, Stone Cold can compound its value by 15% a year. Say for at least the next 10 years, you, you have to look at that time that I showed you just now, Stone Cold just has 3% market share. So it can continue to grow well for the next 10 years at 15%. That means in 10 years time, Stone Cold would be worth about $223 a share. And the formula is simple where it's just $55 multiplied by one plus 15% to the power of 10. And if that's the value of Stone Cold in 10 years, if today you decide to just go and go ahead and buy it at $65, you, 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 you see yourself as a long-term investor, so you do mind overpaying a bit, then your final return after 10 years is actually a uh, average Kaga of 13.1% if you just reverse the math out. And that's not too bad. I mean, it's not too far from the 15%. And some of these companies, they are high growth companies. They are in technology, there are a lot of optionalities a lot of new businesses they can enter into because they have established this strong business relationship with the client. So there could be a lot of upside too. We, we never know. So what if we are wrong? So here I have this table here where just now we see if Stone Cold compounds at 15% for 10 years and if you overpay by about 18 or 20%, then, then you, your final return is 30%. But what if we are wrong? Stone Cold is actually more powerful than we think that it can compound at 20%, then your final return will be 18%. So if you don't buy today, because it's overpriced a bit, then you could be risk, risking out this. And what if we are wrong that Stone Cold is a not that good company, it can only compound at 10%, then after 10 years, you still get 8% a year. I mean, is it better than, than what you can get from bank or bonds or, or some other companies? What are your opportunity costs? So this gives you a framework to think about what type of returns you can get and everyone have different required rate of return. It depends on like, how much cash you have, what you're aiming for, what's your risk averse, risk reward uh, preference and what opportunities you have on hand. So it's, it's your own personal decision to see, to, to think about what is best for you to do. And, and we'll just leave that with you. And this is just a way to think about it. And sorry, and for those of you who are interested in, in this spreadsheet that calculates all this return, assuming different price, different compounding uh, rates and the number of years we have made available this spreadsheet to you. So at this link, so if you want, you can go and download it and, and Say if Stone Cold is eighty dollars today, then you can put it in and see what kind of returns you can get finally if you if you decide to go with eighty dollars. Next, we also introduce you to a way to think about portfolio construction, 
and those who have attended our tutorials for our investing fundamentals program would have heard this, but uh, a good concept, I think it's worth repeating until it really punch into you. And, and for those who are new, just you'll be able to see this concept. So let's look at what if we own a portfolio of 10 compounders which we think are high quality, what will happen after 10 to 20 years? It's likely that we will be wrong somewhere, either on the upside or the downside. So maybe let's look at this where if we start with a portfolio of 10,000, we have 10 companies, so we put $1,000 each into one company equally. And then maybe in the end, some of them perform lousier and some of them perform better. So here, all of them differ by 3%. So the final compounding rate is between 3% to 27%, with two 15% in between. And the simple average of this return is just 15%. But let's look at what this actually translates to us. So if we look at the math here, if we just look at company one first, if we invest $1,000, it's compounded at 3% a year for 10 years. That means uh, after 10 years, the value is $1,000 to the uh, multiplied by 1.03 to the power of 10. And we get that investment would turn into $1,300. And then we do the same for different companies for different years. And if we add up all of them, our portfolio size of 10,000 will compound to 20,000, 48,000, 120, blah, blah, blah. And this actually translate into a portfolio overall compounding rate, annual compounding rate of 16% if we do it for five years, 17% for 10 years, 18% for 15 years. And it just keep increasing as the, the, the horizon goes into the future. And remember, this compounding rates that we've assumed for these companies, they have a simple average of 15%. But what works out to be our final portfolio return is actually higher than 15%. And, and the reason is very simple is because of the exponential effect that our human brain is not easily, we, we can't easily process it because we always think linearly, most of us. It's very hard to figure out the second order impact, the exponential impact, the non-linear impact. So for these companies that actually compound faster than 15%, the higher they compound at, that effect actually gets compound such that after a few years, they grow to a very large value. So let me go back one slide for the company number 10. It actually grows to say one, 1.3 million after 30 years versus the largest company that only have 2,000. Look, look at this, how different are they? And, and that's because your downside is always kept at 100% for a company. The most you can do is 100% is if you invest in equity of a business. And, but the upside can be a lot higher. So it's this exponential curve. And because we, we have companies at the upper end of the exponential curve that makes the overall portfolio return much higher or, or quite higher than 15%. And this goes further away higher, the, the further out we go. And this is why we, we know that we'll definitely make mistakes in, in our portfolio selection. Either we miss the upside or miss the downside. I mean, and on the valuation range, you'll always be a large range. But what matters to us is, as Josh Soros has said long time ago, is not whether you are right or wrong that is important, but how much money do you actually make when you're right and how much you lose when you're wrong. So if we trust the math, the math is correct. I mean, if you if you if you top it, you can go and do the math. But if you really understand that concept, we are okay with being wrong. We will make a few few mistakes here and there. But in the end, just because of how that compounding effect works, which we have shown you in in math terms, even if you are wrong, we will get more than fifteen percent. Come on, like how how good is that? You make a mistake, you aim for fifteen percent, you make a mistake, you get more than fifteen percent. So we just have to trust that exponential compounding effect in place. And what matters for us is to be able to benefit from that final return. We need to be able to hold on to it. If we don't hold on to the biggest winner for many years, then we don't get to benefit, be benefit from that outsized growth. And then, then our return could be lower than 15%. So that's the hard part, which is why we need to have conviction in our company. If you have enjoyed this video, please smash the like button below and subscribe to our YouTube channel. This will help us with the YouTube algorithm and keep us motivated to bring more of such high quality content to you. Do join us in our investment forum on Facebook, using the link in the description below, where we discuss lots of interesting businesses and investing concepts. Do check out our multi-bagger research series at the link in the description below, where we discuss in detail great businesses to own and compound your wealth for the long term. These great businesses have high growth in revenue, profits and free cash flows. For example, this global payments company has grown at a compounded annual growth rate or CAGR of 60 to 80%.
while this technology company has grown its revenue at a CAGR of 80%. And this other payments company has grown its revenue and profits at a CAGR of 20 plus percent.